or the grab and stab, where they start here and keep pulling, and they'll be fighting over the knife. And everybody does, it's weird with a knife, everybody does it. The other arm is probably going to be doing some kind of defensive measure while you access your gun. So, you know, really stress people on that one hand to draw technique. But the other thing is like, the paper is not going to resist your technique. So if you're the cardboard, I can, you know, simulate thumb and eye, I can access my firearm, I can start delivering rounds, I can get distance and I'm good to go, right? Mm -hmm. But a real person is not going, probably not going to allow you to do that. Here, the knife's still coming in. Yeah, right. That's why the moment that the knife happens, it automatically, you have to work, you have to take the yeah. knife. Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. This week's video, we're going to be talking about close retention defense against knife and gun attacks. I'm here with Matt Powell, Promec. I am a firearms instructor. That's my primary goal in life. That's my primary occupation. When it comes to the martial arts, the physical techniques, I can do them. I can practice them. But I don't consider myself a teacher of those techniques. So for that, I defer to an expert. Uh, I've been working with Matt. I've known Matt for a decade or more. Uh, and he's always my, I guess you could call, subject matter expert that I lean on when I want to teach those techniques and when I want to help explain those techniques to the general public. Matt? Thanks, Aaron. I think sometimes when you watch these videos, you, you find that people have edited it heavily, and so they edit, 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 and then next thing you know, you're watching a movie. Yeah, and you're not actually watching what happens, so we're going to take you through conversations on the gun, conversations on the knife, and then we're going to put a little Spartan training gear into it so you can see it full speed. That's another thing most people don't do. Yeah. They don't gear up. Yeah. The, the key things to remember that you'll hear constantly talked about is, is that whether you have a gun or whether you have a knife or whether it's your bare hands or whether you have a bow staff or whatever, is that every fight is a knife fight. If you act as if every fight is a knife fight and you think that a knife will come into play at any time, then you will constantly fight as fast as you can to stop the fight as quick as possible. Whether it's a small little pocket knife or a kitchen knife or fucking crocodile Dundee, if the knife comes into play, it's very different and it can always come into play. You'll see a couple of things that people are going to go, oh, well, I don't know about that, I don't know about that. One of the things that I recommend that you do is, is you can research me. You can research the people that I've worked with and things that I've done. And of course, you know Aaron. But make sure that when you're talking about this stuff that you're looking at combatives, blend it with martial art, and you're not talking to somebody that's a black belt in Taekwondo, trying to go out there and spin kick the knife out of somebody's hand. Yeah, that's where most people are getting it from. And that's what they think they're doing, or they're doing a lot of different stuff out there thinking they're going to get in a knife fight with a slot master, and you're not. You're going to get in a fight with a knife, you're going to get ambushed by somebody that is either a complete rank amateur or somebody that's about to go pro that's done it enough times on the street that they know what they're doing with the knife. But you're never going to end up with all this stuff. So that's bullshit. I like to call it bullshit. I've watched hundreds of fights online, I've had a few myself. I've never seen it, so don't expect it. Expect it to be a few different types and for it to go a very particular way. And that's what we're going to cover. I appreciate Aaron having me on this video. All right, so let's talk about three things that I hear a lot of times and people always mess them up a little bit. The first thing is, is that people think they're actually going to get into a knife fight. What they're actually going to get into is a knife ambush. Um, people generally do not know that the knife is going to come into play unless it is shown readily. Most of the time, it's going to come from out of nowhere. So when he has this, very rarely, unless he's threatening to do anything to me, he, most of the time, if you look at all the metrics that we know of, when that knife comes out, unless it's a passionate situation, or unless they're threatening for a robbery, most of the time it's going to be an ambush. So I'm not going to know that it's there. That's why we always talk about that you treat every fight like it's a knife fight because I have no idea that fight, that knife is there. So if we're going to talk and we're going to communicate and he punches me, I'm already dead. So most of the time you are going to get ambushed, you are not going to get attacked. And if you think you're going to pull your own knife in order to fight the knife fight, this is not West Side Story. You are not going to be able to get that thing and deploy it quick enough to worry about getting him off of you with this situation. If you can see that knife right now, then you are Jason Moore, because most people are not going to see that knife when it actually hits them. The next thing is, is that a knife fight can go very critical very quickly. It doesn't, you are, a lot of people say expect to be stabbed, expect to be cut. You should expect to be stabbed. You should expect to be cut. But you should also expect that depending on where they hit you, you can die very quickly or you can run out of hydraulics very quickly. 
So anything when you look at anywhere that they punch, taking the shot into here, taking the shot directly into here, if you end up grappling with somebody, taking the shot into there, you're going to bleed out very quickly. You're not going to, you, if you continue to fight, your fighting ability is going to be reduced dramatically because you're going to have so much blood loss. So your brain is going to get affected and you're not going to be able to power everything that you need to power. So you have to remember that when the knife comes into play, the longer you engage the knife, the more opportunity happens for that knife fight to become a critical incident that you end up in the ER with a bunch of blood packs on you. So make sure that you understand that yes, you might get cut and yes, you might get stabbed. But the other problem with it is, is that anything that they generally will punch you can end up with a really, really critical situation. If you think you're just going to take it on the arms, if you look at Bondo and they talk about constantly if the person had their arms up like this, it's cutting and trying to get in, you're not going to end up in that situation. Most of the attacks are just going to be wild attacks, wild attacks. And if you look at the, the trajectory on that and where it's going, you're very quick to end up into here. And the last thing that you have to remember is, is that if you disengage the knife, you are very likely to panic. So one of the things that you'll see if you go through and you start looking at tons of video and you start talking to people that have survived knife attacks is that if you back up, you will continue to back up. The moment that you mentally decide not to engage that knife, you are less likely to re-engage the knife. At that point, and you're backing up, there's a reason why we naturally weren't designed to run backwards after prey. We run backwards to get away from things. And the more you run backwards, the more likely you are to trip and fall, end up on the ground with him over you, stabbing you. If you think dealing with the knife up here is tough, try dealing with the knife down here. That is why the moment the knife comes out, you can take a step back to create distance, but you cannot take two steps back. You have to be willing to take a step back and attack that knife and attack what's controlling the knife because if you continue to back up, you're going to panic and you're going to continue trying to get away from the knife. So there's three things that you want to remember whenever you're looking at a knife situation. A, you're probably going to get ambushed. You're not going to end up in West Side Story. You're not going to pull out that $400 folder start going to town with each other. He's going to ambush you and he's going to start stabbing. Secondly, very quickly and go critical. Anywhere that he can punch you, if he can hit you in the chest, hit you in the throat, if you clinch and pull him down and he hits you, you can end up in the hospital very quickly. So that's why, even though you're going to get stabbed and you're going to get cut, you have to remember that you have to be careful about that. That's why we get offline. And third, back up equals panic. You can take a step back, but if you take two steps back, you're running away. So you have to be willing to engage that knife right off the bat because once you start backing up and that knife's coming at you, you're not going to take the psychological chance of re-engaging, most likely. So one thing that I teach is, and I hate to put things in neat little boxes, but there are neat little boxes for a reason. When we think about when we're going to have to defend ourselves, uh, when we're going to have to exercise violence, there's profit crimes. So he's got a knife, and he's using that knife as a vehicle to obtain profit. So wallet, car keys, hey, get in the car, I'm going to drive you to the ATM, you're going to get me all the money you can, and I'll leave you alone, whatever. So, you know, it's a very temporary kidnapping. Then we've got passion crime. So maybe you, I'm dating your ex-girlfriend now, or we work together and you're like, I hate John, he always fucks up the copy machine, or any number of situations you can create, we could be related. You know, maybe it's a family barbecue, you had a little too much drink, and you're like, I'm gonna stab that kid for what he did in third grade. Then we have what we, what has become more prevalent uh, as far as coverage is random acts of violence. You think about active shooter situations. Well, you can have an active stabber situation too. China has experienced two of them in the recent past. And granted, that's a whole other country away, but you have to think about the fact that it's entirely possible that that happened here as well. So if I'm dealing with a profit crime, so you got the knife, right? You're waiting for an exchange. So you're like, hey, give me your wallet. Yeah. That buys me a little bit of reactionary time. I've got time to plan and decide on what I'm going to do. So I could literally just say, you know what? Here's my wallet, dude. I don't want any trouble. 
because the wallet isn't worth my life. Because on the other side of it, so here's, here's, here's the other side of the situation, if I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna go and shoot. So now I'm accessing my firearm. How close is he? So, close the distance. Even if I get my gun out, I'm still getting stabbed. He will go into a natural self-defense mode because he sees a gun come out. His main concern is going to be to kill me and get control of that gun. So now I'm taking knife stabs. I've got no reactionary gap whatsoever. And my firearm, when produced, I may lose control of it because he's going to attack the gun, most likely. And now I've been stabbed in the hands, the arms, the face, the neck, whatever, and I've lost my ability to protect my life. And then you have random act of violence, which what Matt was talking about earlier is just, it's going to be an ambush. You may have, you don't know the person, you don't know the situation, you're just standing there and suddenly you feel like you got punched, and then you realize you get punched, you got stabbed. So when we think about accessing the firearm in these situations, we have to consider that there's three totally different categories and we kind of have to plan accordingly for them. One of the things that we talk about in the EPL, which is the conceptual learning method from Promac, is that in order to really be able to do something in combat, you not only have to train it at the heart rate that you're going to have and experience it at that heart rate, you also have to repeatedly test it that. Most people that are doing high level, fine motor skill types of disarms are not doing that repeatedly under high stress situations. So to think that they're actually going to get into a situation and actually use that is very, very inaccurate. So one of the things that we want to work on is what we're actually going to have happen to us, which is gross motor skills. That's what we're going to have if we actually have the knife pulled on us. Now one of the things that I want to point out is, is two things. Knife size. We have the knife that we've been showing repeatedly, and then we have the big crazy knife. It's important to remember that the moment that you engage this, these right here do make a difference in the amount of space that you have to work up against the knife. And it's something that you have to be cognizant of. The moment that you see the knife, you have to think about the fact that keeping distance means keeping control. So don't forget that knives come in various sizes and everything that would work against this might not work on that based on the depth that it can go. If I get stabbed with this versus if I get stabbed with that is a completely different type of wound. So you have to be cognizant of the knife and you have to train with different knife sizes. If you're always training with this knife size and you're not training with that or vice versa, you're cheating yourself. So let's look at a couple of things. You can push one down you want. First off, the moment that you see the knife, one of the things that you want to do is that if you see the knife, distract and attack. So that's one of the first things is that if he does produce the knife and we're sitting here and we're talking, I'm going to distract and attack. I'm going to distract and attack. If it's up here, I'm going to distract and attack. The first thing I'm going to do. If I don't know the knife is there, but I treat every knife, every fight like it's a knife fight, and I gotta go offline. So no matter what it is, whether the person is just punching or whatever it is, I have to get offline. So I have to get out here. Now the moment that I get out here, you'll notice that if he has the knife, now he has to get back across his body, and he has to work in such a way that he can bring the knife to me. If I'm lucky enough to get outside this way and be able to control the knife, it's a very good situation because I can constantly be pushing against him. The grab is very important. Once I've gotten offline, I've got to get a hold of this area, but I have to control everything that's attached to it. It's one of the most important things. People think they're just going to control this, fight me. You will see how quickly he is able from here to rotate under like he did and come back up on me like any good chronic student. So this has to move to there. You see that it makes it much more difficult to control and grab and control the entire structure attached to the knife instead of just grabbing this part right here. If you think you're going to do this stuff, you're lying to yourself. If you think you're going to keep it low right here, you're going to end up not having kids. So you have to make sure that you get, you see that knife? You get off the line, and you're trying to control everything. Now you'll notice that I'm in control because I will put my body right there. The grab has to control the entire structure. That control has to minimize his amount 
to rotate around constantly this way. That's why it has to control everything up into here. Whether it's blocking its ability to come back that way or go up that way, whatever it may be, that control has to stop this rotation. We've stopped it from coming back this way, now we have to stop it there. So there's a couple things, get offline, grab the whole thing and control the whole thing and you'll be much more likely to survive the ambush. All right, let's talk about hand structure when it comes to a grab. So, people think that they're going to be able to strip the knife out of somebody's hands, right? So, under just a regular, we're just standing here having a normal conversation, everything's fine, right? So I want to demonstrate a couple of things to you. Grab that rope. Don't let me pull this out of your hand. Pull it, come on. Okay. So that's a big rope, that's a nice little 20 pound kettlebell. Now, put the knife in your hand. You think I'm going to try to pull that out of his hand? I can't get a rope or a kettlebell out of it. If you think you're going to actually be able to strip this with a rope, he had like, a lot, let's see, that much space around the rope. There's still that right there. This, that much fits. I couldn't get out of his hand. This, he's got his whole hand around it. You're not going to be able to strip this out of his hand. The other part of it is we're completely controlled. Neurologically, the moment that the fight starts, one of the things that Aaron talks about is people startle and they shoot. I got that reflexive grip. The moment the fight starts, he's going to be more likely to death grip that knife. He's not going to allow me. Ready? I'm not going to get it. So to think that you're actually going to be able to strip the knife in some way away from him, let's switch. Ready? Okay, that's real smart. The only way I can get it out of his hand, I can't even get it that way. So the important thing to remember is, is that you're not going to get the knife away from somebody. Grab my foot. I'm not going to do that to you anymore. Okay? You going to let go of that knife? We're not even panicking. To think you're actually going to get that targeting down? Ready? Think you're going to get that targeting down? You're not. You have to control the knife. You're not going to get it away from him unless he drops it. If you want him to drop it, you've got to cause extreme pain up here. It's going to make him open that hand up to protect his face. If I put my thumb completely in his eye, he may let go of the knife, drop it, to try to pull my hand off. He, he's going to do that. Or he's going to flail wildly and cut me even more. Or I have to knock him out. I have to create a concussion. Or I have to knock him out in order for him to drop that. Under perfect circumstances, when people are James Bourne on YouTube, they can get this knife out. What you need to count on when the person decides that they're going to attack you, that it's not going to be perfect, you're not going to get the knife out, because under perfect circumstances, I can't get it out. I've been doing this 20 years. So, I have to control this, control that, and then work. All right, so we're obviously not just talking about unarmed techniques. Uh, if I find myself in the unfortunate situation where I don't have a firearm, or I only have my own knife, uh, a lot of these techniques stop at controlling the knife, but for me, I need to talk about well, at what point would it be prudent for me to access my firearm? Because my firearm is going to give me a distinct advantage and give me a higher degree of survivability and the effectiveness of being able to deliver violence than I would have without it, which is why guns exist and why we use them. But the gun is not a magic wand. Just because he's got a knife and I go for a gun doesn't mean he's going to suddenly, mysteriously just give up and say, okay, you win. If we're already this close and engaged, and I decide to go for a gun, he's going to close the distance. So maybe before I even get the gun out, no matter how fast the draw is, so we'll just do real speed. You got the knife, I'm going to go for the gun. Let's see how fast it is. So I've got the gun out, and I'm able to deliver shots, but look where the knife's at. Now, could that have gone differently? Yeah. 
Distance is distance. The more distance I have from my threat, the more time I have to react. So I can either feint the situation based on the situation. So if he's a give me your wallet kind of guy, the wallet can buy me distance and time to react to the situation. So I can simply be like, look, dude, I, wallet, wallet, it's right, dude, it's right here. Would that work? It just did. That doesn't mean it's going to work in every situation, but it does give me another option if I'm worried about speed and reaction. The distance matters. But let's say it's not a profit crime. Let's say it's a personal crime or a crime of passion or however you want to word it. Let's say there's no profit involved. He's not even going to talk to me. It's just going to be knife and defense. So he's going to come in maybe high or low, and I've got to deal with the knife. I've got to be able to defend against the knife. Just like what Matt already talked about. I need to control the knife. I'm a left-handed shooter. I need to deal with the fact that the majority of the people out in the world are right-handed. So I'm already at a disadvantage when it comes to defending because my primary defensive hand to get outside the attack is my gun hand. I've got to come out here and then start dealing with the situation. Is there any way right now that I can access my firearm? No, absolutely not. I have to deal with what I got. I got to start pulling ears, breaking hate, I got to get fingers and eyes, whatever I can do to get him into a situation where I control it. Hopefully convince him to drop this knife by cutting off his airflow or dealing damage to the eye, saying, okay, I got enough, enough damage to his eyes, he drops the knife. At this point, I can disengage with him and then access my firearm. But the idea that I'm just going to use one arm and come in and do this is a little bit unrealistic when we think about what we're facing. He can deliver multiple potentially fatal strikes in a very short period of time with that knife. I have to control what's controlling the knife. I can't strip the knife. We already kind of went over that. Is it possible for you to get your hands inside his fingers and strip the knife? Theoretically, yes. Realistically, no. It's very low on the list of possibilities. So when it comes to control, when it comes to accessing the firearm, I have to find a window, but that window has to be safe. And as much as I want to get my gun out because it increases my ability to survive, I may be able or may have to end the situation before the gun even comes into play. Now the gun's gonna come out, the gun needs to come out, but I have to potentially finish the entire engagement before the gun comes out. At that point, the gun comes out just to maintain compliance with my threat. So if he attacks me, and I'm able to successfully put him in a situation of submission where he does drop the knife, at that point, I'm accessing the gun, and I'm just keeping him a gun point. Now, we teach a lot close action retention shooting, shooting from the hip, shooting from close index, pectoral index, hip index, whatever you want to call it. When we do it on the range, we have a target. It's right there. I have my students come up, they do arms distance, they have to access their weapon. They can do a two-handed draw and shoot, or I make them take their other hand and use it in some kind of defensive manner. So the problem with that, though, obviously, is he's not cardboard. So in what situation do you think where I would be able to perform that technique without risk of suffering harm from that knife? And really, the only situation that I've been able to think of, and just thinking realistically and looking at videos and doing my own research, is if you're somehow able to control his attack method with one hand, which is pretty unrealistic. If he comes in for an overhead strike and I'm fast, maybe. Maybe I can block, gun, maybe. That's a huge maybe. So when you think about knife defense, it's really going to be a situation of I've got to control the knife and get to the gun when it's safe to do so. I can't think of any method I can teach you where you're going to be able to do everything you need to do with one hand and then get the gun out. It's just not realistic. So when you guys are thinking about practicing your close action retention shooting, and we're going to cover this um, in more in depth later, uh, really consider the fact that you got to control the person and the knife and work yourself to a safe window to access the gun. Accessing the gun should not be your default methodology unless you have a window to do so. And that's going to be entirely dependent on the situation you find yourself in. All right, so separating theory from application. Uh, we're going to be using Spartan training gear because it allows us to go near 100%. Uh, I have my attacker. He's got a full suit on, so any kind of techniques I deliver against him, hopefully I don't injure him in real life. The whole point of what we're about to go through is for me to work to my firearm if possible. But if I'm able to end the fight without shooting him, if I'm able to disarm him and then draw my gun and hold him at gunpoint, or whatever, then that's how the situation is going to play out. I'm going to be completely dependent on his actions because the way we're setting this up is this is not choreographed, it's not staged. I don't know exactly what he's going to do. I know I have to defend against it. 
It's not going to be sexy. It's not going to have a soundtrack. It's not going to be from multiple angles. It's going to be as close to the real thing as we can get. Uh, when me and Matt teach together for our weapon retention dynamics class, this is one of the exercises the students get to go through. They get to see what their own skill level is, and no matter how many times they may get poked or not poked, they have to finish the fight. So that's the whole purpose here. So basically, basically what you saw there is I was able to keep the knife from cutting me, I was able to control his momentum on that, but I wasn't able to put myself in a really good position of advantage that I felt comfortable disengaging or trying to uh, put him in a position of disadvantage where I could get him to drop the knife. So I felt myself running out of steam a little bit, we are going like what, 80, 90 percent? He was really trying to cut me. I had to make a decision. And my decision was sacrifice a little bit of my control to access my weapon and start shooting. Where did I get my hits? Back in the side, Mark. Back of the head, shoulder, and then probably in the rib cage and whatnot. That is one way that could have played out. You just saw it happen. Nothing really sexy about it. But it underlines a few points. Control and the ability to access my weapon with one hand and then shoot with one hand until I'm able to get two hands on the gun. So a lot of times what you'll find out is, is that the size of the knife really makes a big difference when it comes from the low attack. So if I'm going to have 10 thin against the low attack, oh, oh, oh god, oh god. The majority of people think that they are actually going to end up in a knife fight like this. Okay. 